Dottie, it's been quite a while since we heard from you. In fact, it's been over a year since you and I went on the Today Show with Matt Lauer and we did CNN. You did an Associated Press interview. How have, let's start with you. How have you been doing since that time? How are you holding up? The same as before. It's just going one day at a time. It does get harder, I think. Because when you see all the things that are going on, it, it just it gets tougher. And to try to keep Jerry's spirits up, I think, makes it harder. When you say you see, say all, when you see all the things going on, what do you mean by that? Um, what the victims are doing, you know, things that are coming out. Um, just different, the way different people act about different things, but when someone acts when someone like doesn't have anything to do with you then another person comes along that replaces that person um, and there's been many people that we have not heard from that we've heard through other people that they can't talk to us which I had said before or that and they want to know how we're doing but yet they don't they can't from their lawyers point of view they can't have anything to do with us and that still really really hurts let's talk about that for just a second so what you mean there is <clears throat> that there are a lot of people who you were close to before all this happened mm -hmm. who have felt like they're not allowed to be in contact with you whether it be from a political standpoint or maybe even a legal perspective how hurtful has that been to you and, and to Jerry it hurts but then I know that, you know, there is a reason. Majority of them, uh, a lot of them, as I said the last time, they would lose their jobs. They've been threatened with their jobs if they have anything to do with us. And just to know that they care, is it, it makes a difference. And I just try not to think about the people that were friends before that aren't now. I mean, they don't have anything to do with us now. And think of the people that we have met when all this has happened and how neat it's been to meet the different people that we have met that have come into our lives. How has the treatment of you changed, if at all, in the last year or so? Uh, do you sense uh, that things are getting uh, uh, like a softening of the atmosphere? Is it is it better? Is there is there more public sentiment and support when you go out and about, or is it the same, or is it worse? I, I think it's the same to me. I mean, I haven't had anything that has happened. Like I, I said before, the last time that we talked, um, you know, people could say things about behind my back, but no one has ever said anything to me. Um, some people, I mean, the other Are day you, I went someplace and somebody, I had to give my name for a reason, and the person was like, oh, okay. And, and they never, you know, it was nothing to do. They didn't even realize the last name. Mm -hmm. But have you gotten any any more signs of support in in the recent yes, year? Yes, there's been a lot of people that were not supportive of ours that have become supporters when they have found the more that's coming out about the case, about the different things that are happening. And that's been noticeable to you? Mm-hmm, it has been. Has that, has that made you feel? It, good, it, you know, it makes me feel really great to know that there are people that believe in Jerry and believe in us. From a day-to-day -day standpoint, Tell us about your life. I mean, I know you go to visit Jerry once a week. Mm -hmm. um, tell, tell us how life is for you here, living essentially alone now that Jerry is in prison. Uh, I know you, you, you obviously have kids and grandkids and all that, but give us a sense of your life in this, this period where now Jerry is in prison with, with no end in sight there. Well, I, I, I go to the gym almost. I try to go to the gym every day. I visit our kids. Our kids visit us. Uh, we have a friend who his wife has Alzheimer's, and I've been helping him with her once once a week. And I help at the church. Um, I, if anybody needs help, I try to help them. Um, there's been other people from our church that one lady, her husband was in the hospital, and I've taken her to the hospital and just try to do for others to keep myself busy. And I, there's enough for me to do that keeps me busy each day. Does it get easier or harder as time goes on? I think it gets, it's, it's a little bit harder, I think, because I, you know, so many things keep happening. 
I don't know how I want to say it. Um, you know, the, it, at the first, it was like, okay, I can deal with this. But then you keep thinking, okay, and then you have family to deal with. And so there's family events, and right. the more things Jerry's missing, right. and you never know if he's ever going to see it again. Right. That's the toughest part. Yes, I think. So how do you deal with it? Like I said before, you just take it one day at a time. I do a lot of praying. Um, I don't know. It's, there's a reason, like I said before, there's a reason for all this. And something is going to come up, whether it's Jerry touches, whether Jerry, not touches, whether Jerry affects somebody else. Um, you know, like, he, like, we, like he and I talk about the people that we have met through this whole thing that we would have never met and how special they are. Let's talk about Jerry. How do you think he's ha holding up? He seems to be doing well. I mean, he's it, he just gets turned down one thing after another. Like he's asked to be moved, and they won't move him. He would like to have a typewriter, and before in his unit you could have typewriters. Now you can't have typewriters, and um, they won't let him buy a typewriter. And um, they've had some issues in the prison where he is because they brought in a mental, a lot of mental cases when the mental hospitals closed. And um, the guards seemed to be really busy with them, and they're in the unit where Jerry is. So there had been times they had missed when they were supposed to go outside. Now they said they're making that all up. They're going to make it up to them, and they won't be missing it like it is. Um, but, but how is he doing mentally? I mean, how did he... He seems to be, he re like he, before, he reads, he writes, he, you know, calls the kids once a week, calls one of our kids each week, um... And, and we're, I think we're going to fight that. We're going to start to fight that at some point because it isn't right because he's supposed to be in protective custody and they have him in administrative custody. From what I understand, they now Pennsylvania does not have any protective custody, mm -hmm. which would be he would have the he would have um, he would have the he would have all the privileges of being in general population, but he would be. His own. I mean, he could have more phone calls. I mean, like people you, in general you, population have phone. They can make as many phone calls a day as they can get to the phone and pay for them. Do you Are you convinced that he's being treated less fairly because of the notoriety of his case? They say it's because of who he is that they have to protect him. But, I mean, not just with regard to his status. I'm talking about with regard to his treatment and his privileges. Do you believe that he's that he is being treated less well because of who he is, because of the notoriety of his case. I, I could, I don't know. You, I don't know. All I know is that they just keep telling him he's being treated the way he's being treated because of, for his protection. That's for his own protection. And when do you, when you talk to him, you go, you visit him on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. Do you notice shifts in his mood? Is is he pretty static? Is, is, how do you think? He's holding together because most people, I mean, I know if I was in his position, knowing what I believe about this case, I would have lost it a long time ago. Well, he, how, there, how, there's how, sometimes that he'll get really, when we're talking, he'll get really upset. Um, and he'll say, you know, how, how can people do what they did? How can they do what they did? And when he says, how can they, who do you think he's referring to there? The victims. Because there were people that he that he he thought that he was helping them, and he thought that they were going they would have a good life, and that they you know were going to do something with themselves. Let's and, talk about that for a minute, because okay. I think this is a really important point, especially now that we have a little bit more twenty twenty hindsight. How much? It's my view, Dottie, that. Jerry was remarkably naive about what these accusers slash victims were capable of doing. Would you first of all agree with that assessment? Was Jerry... I th and we're both like that. I mean, I, there was no way I'd ever think that Matt would do what Matt has done. No way at all. I mean, even all we, uh, we've been through so much with him, all we've been through with him, I never ever believed he would, you know, do, do what he has done. 
and how he could live, how he can live with himself. I don't know how they, any of them, can live with. I don't know how they can live with themselves. But, and I agree with all of that. But with regard to Jerry specifically, he's obviously the person at the center of this. Do Do you think that when all this happened, that Jerry just kept thinking this is so impossible that something is going to happen to fix this? Right. Oh, we, I think we all did. That's that's how our whole family felt. That it was just so un, in, unfathomable. Right. That it, in, a, in a weird way, and I say this to people all the time, I said, only an innocent person would have been so slow to respond to his situation as Jerry was. Because a guilty person knows immediately... Oh my gosh, I'm in big trouble. Right. I need to lock this down. I need to take care of this person, that person. I need to get a lawyer. I need to get the best lawyer. None of that really happened. Can you look back and go, boy, that was the moment that we really should have known that we needed to go all out in a, in defense here. Do you I mean do you think about those kinds of things? Do you think about, wow, back when such and such happened, we should have been more on alert. Does that ever occur to you? I guess I don't try to think, I don't, I really don't try to think about it. I just sort of let it go by, it's done with, and we have to work on the appeal, and we have to work on what we can do coming forward. What do you, you, you know that I now believe Jerry is 100% innocent. I've always known that you believed that Jerry was 100% innocent. But does Jerry have any regret as far as what uh, any mistake he made in judgment as far as how to handle, for instance, Matt? Like, one of the things I think he made a big mistake, and Jerry would acknowledge this, telling Matt that Alan Myers, the victim number right. two, had flipped right. was clearly a huge mistake, right? Well, Jerry was telling our family and Matt was here with us. But that was obviously in Probably retrospect. Probably a big mistake. I mean, in retrospect, that was the moment when... But who knows whether that would have made any difference. Matt on his own might have gone on and done In theory, did. but if you use the logic, they used, Matt went to the same lawyer that Alan has. Mm -hmm. So, it's an awful amazing coincidence that just before the trial, Jerry tells, among other people, Matt, that Alan Myers, the McQuarrie victim, has flipped. And then all of a sudden, Matt decides in the middle of the trial, or after basically the first day or two of the trial, to flip. And he goes where? He goes to Alan Myers' attorney, Andrew Shubin. I mean, that, that, that's more than coincidence. I think so, too. So, but... Are there moments like that, that that Jerry thinks about or you think about and go, boy, I wish we would have done that differently? Yeah, I think anytime, anytime anything like this happens to you, you look back and think how you could have done things differently. Is there anything that comes to mind? No, the whole world just came in on us so quickly that I don't, there was nothing, you know. I mean, he knew he was innocent. I knew he was innocent. And we just, there was just, you know, we didn't you, have money to go get a law, a big lawyer at the time. We didn't know there was some insurance that helped, but I guess we should have, I, I don't know. You, you weren't, I mean, it's clear, and this is the most important point, because I don't, there's so many misperceptions here, but one of them is that somehow... Jerry, being this big football legend, what would have been prepared in all ways to fend off uh, allegations like this. Is it fair to say that up until the time he gets arrested, that this really wasn't even a major focus in your lives? No, it wasn't. So you guys were blindsided. Right. And of course, you were totally blindsided by the McQuarrie situation, right? I mean, that never, right. that never right. even. Right, because we knew, you know, who Alan was, and Alan had talked. To, you know, Alan had been talking to Jerry, and playing golf with Jerry. Yeah. Just before the the crap hit the fan. Mm-hmm. But but you and you were aware of the of the Aaron Fisher allegation, right. but 
take me through that for a second, because I think this is really important. And this is part of why I don't think you guys were on edge, because I don't think you guys took the Aaron Fisher situation all that seriously, because you knew who Aaron Fisher was, you knew his history, you knew his, his mother, you knew his storytelling. Give us a sense of, of how confident you and Jerry were that the Aaron Fisher situation on its own was not going to cause a major problem. Well, because what he, it was, what he said was not true. And, you know, we were always the belief that the truth wins out. But I guess in this situation, it doesn't. Now that we've had some more time and we've seen more things, you've already alluded to this, we've seen more things happen. For instance, with regard to the quote unquote victims getting their money and spending their money. And boy, have the, a lot of them spent it. They've spent it big time. Uh, and even some of the moms have spent it big time. I know you've seen the picture of the, the Porsche and the, and the Mercedes that, that Don, Aaron Fisher's mother, has in her garage. What's your reaction when you see those photos? I... I... I really don't know. I mean, if that's what she likes and that's what, how she wants to spend her money, but the money's not going to be there. It's going to be gone soon if that's how she wants to spend her money. But, I mean, but Dottie, my view on this is any mom, if her story was true, would have, and if Aaron was really abused, and you thought that your son was abused because of partially your doings. I mean, you know, if, if Aaron's story is true, it was Dawn who was, you know, basically feeding her son to this molester because Jerry was taking care of Aaron a lot. Oftentimes when Dawn was going to go out partying, wouldn't a mom have far too much guilt to even dream of using her son's settlement money to buy a Porsche and a Mercedes? I would think. And I don't, I mean, Aaron had to give her the money. Well, unless my, she got money too, unless both of them. Well, got money. my just so you know, my understanding from people close enough to the case to her situation to know it is that Dawn controls Aaron's money, so Aaron basically gets an allowance from Dawn, and that Dawn, as I believe she has through most of this case, is is pulling the strings. And I, I really do believe. Do you, do you agree that Don? Well, she said in the she said in the book, or it says in the book, how she kept pestering the attorney general's office, and she kept going after everybody because they weren't doing things she wanted them to do. Well, she was a, very much a key there, but I think she was key even before that. I think she was key in in making sure that they went to the school, that Aaron's story evolved. I mean, she was telling people from very early on how much money she was going to make, what she was going to do with the money. Aaron did the same thing. She even, our son Matt told us when he was down at the grand jury that they were eating breakfast or lunch or something, and she even said then that, you know, she was going to get this huge house in State College, and she told somebody that she was going to have our house. She did. She told her neighbor that. Very, from the very moment that she caught any wind of Aaron making any sort of a, even a benign allegation. But let me, let me I want maybe take this in a slightly different direction. <clears throat> because my theme here is we now know what a lot of us had suspected. Mm -hmm. We suspected that this money was a motivating factor here. When the trial happened, none of the accusers had been paid yet. So it was all in theory. Do you think the jury might have seen things differently if they knew what we know now that, for instance, Aaron and Don and others have done exactly what we suspected they would do with the money and that, this, that, that money was a huge factor? Because at the time, it was in theory, they might get paid, but now they were paid millions and they've spent the money exactly as many of us suspected that they would. Do you think that would have made a difference? 
If I was on the jury, yes, it would make a difference. I don't know about the people that were on the jury. I would think they would look at it differently, but I don't know. Let me ask you about your testimony. Frank Fina, the prosecutor, made a big to-do in his interview with Armin Katayan uh, for 60 Minutes, which to me was one of the first moments. And the, by the way, when I saw this, Dottie, I was still thinking that Jerry might be guilty. And when I heard Frank Fina say this, I thought, wow, there's something really wrong here because I knew you very well at that point. He made a big deal about the fact that during your testimony, you were asked why would these people say this about Jerry if it wasn't true? And in his description of it, you got silent, you're kind of slumped, you sighed, and there was no real response. Now, I've heard that that's not really what happened. By the way, do you... Do you would, I don't how, remember. You don't remember. Okay. But more importantly, he used that in his mind as the aha moment that even Dottie realized, even Dottie realized, because he, he then describes you as looking over to Jerry and kind of like helplessly going, well, what do I say? And in his mind, this was the aha moment that Dottie Sandusky even knew that Jerry was guilty. I'm wondering, because I know you pretty well, I know you, you don't, you, religiously you don't like to use the word lie, correct? You, that's a word that is problematic for you. Mm -hmm. And at the time, these accusers hadn't been paid yet. So it was been difficult for someone to say they're doing it for the money when they haven't been paid yet. Right. Had they, had, we, had they been paid already, or if we knew for sure that what has happened would happen, do you think your testimony would have been different? Do you think... Probably, because I would have said probably for the money. Right. That's what I'm getting at. That if you knew then what you know now, you would have been able to say, I can answer that question, they're doing it for the money. Because if you look, majority of, most of them did not have, they had bad credit, they were in debt, they didn't have money, and they needed money. And of course, they all got paid, except for there's one so far, ironically, the 1998 victim, victim number six, has not yet settled which is mind-blowing when you consider the fact that that was investigated and Jerry was found to not be right. uh, liable or anything. I mean, there was no arrest, no nothing. Um, and he's asking for the most money. By the way, can you make any sense of that? As lawyers, I guess, I don't, I don't know. Okay. But is there... I, I'm curious, do you, do you wish that you had the opportunity to testify again? I mean, if, if you had it, knowing what we know now. Right, yeah. yes. What do you think you would have said differently? It's so hard when you get up there on the stand. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't like to put people down, you know. But I, they put an innocent man in jail or in prison. Um, and I would just ask, how could they, how can they stand there and lie? But in today's world, I think so many people lie, and that's the way they live, and they really believe their lies. And I think now most of them have gone to therapy, and I think the therapists have made them start believing their lies, and they really believe what they've been told. Do you agree with me that part of the, there's many elements to the perfect storm in this case, but part of the perfect storm was the age group of the accusers. These were mostly guys uh, from Aaron being the youngest to guys in their 20s. And to me, that generation, inherently partially because of their younger age, but also because I think things are changing in our culture. I think that to that age group, Lying isn't that big of a deal. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that? Mm -hmm. I agree with that. And I think that to Jerry and probably to you, that was there was a generational gap as to you guys understanding what younger people are capable of. Probably. Because to you, that was... I don't think all young people are like I'm not that. suggesting all young people. I'm suggesting that there's not the same value. Right. Or there's not the same taboo. Let me put it that way. 
I mean, in your generation, there's still a taboo about lying. Mm -hmm. you, you, you have a difficult time even saying someone's a liar, even when you know they're lying, right? Right. right. Someone who's 25 years old, especially if they're going to get paid for that lie, I don't think has that same hesitancy or taboo. And, I mean, you take Matt. He lied so many times when he lived with us and the things we went through with him. I mean, I, I, I don't know why we ever believed him. We always believed that he was going to change every time he turned around that he was going to be better. And he would for a while. But, you know, he, had you, he would have you believing his lies when he told you lies. So Matt's the one that shocked you the most, by far. I mean, obviously he was your son. Alan and Matt. Alan Myers mm -hmm. and Matt, mm -hmm. and and I and they were you know they went to the same lawyer, mm -hmm. and I think their stories are somewhat connected. I think that Alan flipping allowed Matt the permission to do it, because if Alan did it, then right. for for Matt, I don't think it was that difficult. Right. Um, how often do you think about Matt? I, I think about him a lot. I really miss, I still really miss his kids. And I miss him. I mean, I, he was a part of our family. I feel sorry for him because I, I know I don't, he can't be at peace with himself, I don't believe. Um, I mean, he's the only one that knows that. But I, I don't think of all the vacations he's taking and the things he's doing and um, how he says he's helping, he's helping um abused people, but he's really, he, he helps them in a way, but he's really not doing, his foundation doesn't really do anything to help other than he goes out and speaks. Well, I offered his foundation $10,000 for him to sit down and do an interview right. with me. For some reason, he hasn't taken me up on that offer. Right. I, I wonder why. Uh, in all the things that he has done, the Oprah interview, the Happy Valley movie where he directly takes a shot at you and Jerry. Um, obviously, the taking of the money, some of the things he said in speeches, he's gone after you specifically. He keeps going after you more and more. One time, I don't know if you remember this or you maybe blocked it out, but he actually starts to imply that you were aware okay, of his abuse. I yeah, I think you blocked it out. But he, he has said in speeches... That's good. That's good. Oh, that's great if that's if that's how Matt, you know, Matt is Matt has to deal with himself and has to live with himself. And it can't be good with his other relationships to live the lies that he lives. Well, if he really was, you know, I, I guess I would I guess I would say if he really Okay, say he says all this happened. And if it really did happen, and he felt like he says he feels and he wants to help all these abused people. And then why in the world could he not give us back our things that he has? You know, uh, apologize to us for all the, all, the thing, all the long nights that we went through and all the things we went through with him. And, and pay us back for all the money he borrowed that we never, ever got back from him. You know, if he really, really, truly feels if things were really the way he's saying things are then why would he I mean to me that's what as a Christian that's what you do when you you repent when you've done something wrong and you go to the person and repent to them and I would go talk to Matt but I've been told I shouldn't because well I don't think he would talk to me anyway but I've been told that I should not talk to him well, I have a feeling he might watch this video. What would you say to him right now? If he was here right now and you had an opportunity to say anything you wanted to Matt Sandusky, what would you say? I, I hope he's happy with his life. And, you know, I hope to goodness that he, that he has a good life and that his kids turn out well and that, um, you know, he can look people in the eye and say, you know, I'm telling the truth. But he hurt you and Jerry badly, regardless of his impact on the case, which I think was huge, because he's the reason why Jerry didn't take the stand. People misunderstand why that was. People, right. people, The media, of course, is completely, and I even bought into the wrong 
narrative there. The reality is you sat next to Matt the first day of the trial. The first it, half of the day. Right. So if Jerry, so if Jerry gets on the stand, they can bring Matt on rebuttal. And now we look back, we should have, they should have done it. Oh. And they should have made Matt come back. Absolutely. And then our other kids would have testified against Matt. It was a huge strategic mistake, but it was one that was logical. Because if, if Matt testifies and one juror remembers him sitting next to you that first day, the case is over. That's all it would have taken. Because Matt would have been deemed to have superpowers at that point. But let's get back to my, my question. Matt hurt you guys a lot even without the impact on the case. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you deal with that emotionally? I mean, the emotional betrayal of everything you did for him. You took him out of poverty. You got him through a suicide attempt. You adopted him at age 18. All these things that you did for Matt, and he ends up betraying you like that. How do you deal with that emotionally? As I said, I do a lot of praying, I do a lot of crying, and um, I just, I, I know that God will do, will do something good out of the whole thing. So, not just with Matt, but with everybody, that something, will, something good is going to come out of this. Do you know what that'll be? No, I don't. I think a lot of people think that, I just read an article where it says now that it's the, um, the abuse cases are so high and a lot of the places can't take care of it. But then I keep thinking there's so many kids that are still abused that aren't. it's not reported. And half of the cases that are reported um, are not abuse cases. It's just like somebody, a, a kid is saying they're mad at their parent mm -hmm. or something. And they're saying well, something it's interesting that. you mention that because I was in Pittsburgh and the head, front page headline in the Pittsburgh paper was, uh, state police overrun with abuse claims. Subheadline: Sandusky, Sandusky case, case is blamed for that, or not? I don't know if they used the word blame, but it, it, the reason the reason given right. is because of the Sandusky case and the laws that were changed. Now you can look at that obviously a number of different ways, but I mean, is that theoretically something? Let's pretend that more real abusers are being reported because of what happened with Jerry. Is that something you can hang? On to and say, well, there's some good that came out of this? Right. As long as that's the case, as long as they're not abuse cases that are not real abuse cases. Uh, there was just a study that was done, and they said that of the people that are in prison for abuse, 40% of them are not guilty. Do you know what that was? I mean, how do they, how do they determine something? I don't know. I don't yeah. know how they do. All right, let's go back to, to Jerry for a second. As we do this interview in, in, in mid-late August, uh, we're still waiting on the state to respond to Jerry's petition for, um, for a hearing and a new trial. What is the sense, what is Jerry's level of optimism? I know Jerry's an incredibly optimistic person. Uh, he has uh, his, his days that he's very optimistic and days that he's not. And he's looking at everything that he can look at. Poor Al must be crazy because he sends, he's always, almost every day he's sending him something that he thinks of or something he reads in the paper or something that he sees in some area that he thinks they should look at. You know, that's Jerry. I mean, he's still, he hasn't stopped that, that he's still. Does he think he's going to get a new trial or a hearing at least? He's hoping. He hopes. Um, you know, none of us know. All we can do is hope that that will happen. What do you think, in theory, if let's pretend, and I don't, unfortunately, believe it's going to happen because I don't think anyone's going to have the courage, at least at the state level, to order a new trial. But let's pretend there was a new trial. Mm -hmm. How do you think that would go? How would it be different the second time? We would have, we would have, I mean, we would be prepared. We were not prepared for this trial. And, and it wasn't all Joe's fault because the judge was throwing things at him left and right. Like I just read an article the other day and someone said, well, they should have they should have said they didn't want to be on the case. They did. And the judge told them they couldn't do that. Are you talking about Joe Amendola? Yeah, right. Let, let me talk about that with you for a second. It must drive you crazy to think 
Figuratively, of course. <laughs> it must drive you figuratively crazy to think that Jerry's trial was over in seven months from arrest, when here we are almost four years later, and Curly, Schultz, and Spanier aren't even close to a trial. What are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Because I think they, I think they probably don't, they're, I, they must not have, a, they don't have the things to go to trial. Well, they have no case. Right. But my, and I agree with that. I mean, the reason why there hasn't been a trial there is because, well, there's some technical issues that are being panned out. But if the prosecution really wanted there to be a trial, there would be a trial by now. Mm -hmm. They don't want a trial because there's no evidence because it didn't happen. Because there was no cover-up because there was nothing to no. cover up. Right. But from a, from a justice standpoint, from a human perspective, does that not make you frustrated? Oh, yeah. And, that, and like the guy from Bowlesburg Mansion that was charged with sexual, well, he did, what was it, pornography and something else. I mean, his trial has been postponed and postponed and postponed. But nothing on Jerry's. It's amazing how fast Jerry's got rushed through. Mm -hmm. and, and the, the Spaniard, Curley, and Schultz situation proves it. We happen to be talking uh, just after Jared Fogel from Subway um, has pled guilty to child molestation where he paid uh, for his sex uh, victims. And there was also pornography found. Now, the reason I mention this is when you look at cases like that, and that's just one example of many, because now I never thought very much about sex abuse cases until I got involved in this one. But almost every single one I see, there are massive amounts of evidence that don't exist in Jerry's case. Right. I mean, I mean, Jared Fogel pleads guilty, which Jerry has never come close to doing. There was never any allegation that Jerry paid anybody any money for sex. There's never any allegation he used alcohol or, or any sort of drugs or plying to get sex from kids. And there was not a shred of pornography found. Right. Do you... Do you now look at cases like that and go, well, wait a minute, where's all the evidence in our case? Mm -hmm. There was no evidence. It was just all word of mouth. And then when you see that the investigators in your case were the ones found with all the pornography, how does that make you feel? <sighs> Upset. <laughs> By the way, speaking of the pornography, because... Those who want to believe Jerry is guilty will believe anything. Mm -hmm. I'd like you to explain to people how preposterous it would have been for a rather technically challenged Jerry Sandusky to do something that I wouldn't even have a clue how to do, which would be to rid his computer of all signs of any pornography. Could you give us a sense as to Jerry's... There's, no, there's no way he could have done it because he... He had me get his emails for him. He at the very well when he was house under house arrest, he learned how to do emails. But I did his emails for him, and I I and he, um, I would read I would get his emails and read give them to print them out and give them to him, and then he answer his emails for him. And he, he there's no way. I mean he he did learn where he could, like if he wanted to look something up, like if there was. A subject he wanted to look up, he could do that. He, he at but the very, very end. But, but very rudimentary skills. Right, right. A, I mean, there's no way he could go in a. I mean, I don't even know, and I'm pretty computer literate. I I wouldn't even know how to go in and erase all that. And you also told me the story, and I I saw the video firsthand that you discovered a video on Jerry's cell phone that Aaron Fisher had made mm -hmm. that Jerry didn't even know was there. Until you started to take a video of the family singing some songs, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So, tell, I mean, so Jerry had a cell phone that Aaron had basically stolen, made this weird video of him pretending to be captured, and Jerry didn't even know it was there. I don't think Jerry knew even knew his phone could take videos. Yeah, so it's it's one of the many elements of this case where people will believe whatever they want to believe because they don't know Jerry. Right. That's what I get so angry about, and that's why I guess that's what I would want to tell people. You know, if you want to talk about the case and you want to know about the case, 
then you need to meet us and you need to know who we are, our family, the kids, and Mike, Jerry, and myself. What's the most important thing that people don't know about you, Jerry, and the kids that they should know? That we're not the monsters that they said. I mean, there's no way the kid that said he, he, did, he had to eat in the basement all the time, he screamed in the basement, that's not true. Well, he also said that he had lunch with Joe Paterno at Beaver <laughs> Stadium, and there's no way that ever happened. Um, you know, that, that we're just, just because he was a football coach, he didn't think he was better than anybody else. He just wanted to make other people feel good about themselves. Um, you know, we're normal people. I mean, we didn't have, I mean, we don't have a, a whole lot, but we have more than a lot of people have. And we're just a fam, you know, a family. We, we love, we love people. We love to do things for people. Um, that I just wish people would get to know who we are. Your five kids that have remained loyal, mm -hmm. not Matt. Mm -hmm. How have they held up, and what do they think of Matt? They're all angry at Matt. Uh, very upset with Matt. Our one son, Matt, had called him and asked him, "You have to say something. You, you know something happened to you." But um, Matt, just to be clear, Matt contacted him. one of your other right. sons and said, "This is before he came forward, right?" Or it might have been right at the time that he did. I don't right. know. So he was looking yeah. for a, a buddy, right. basically. Right. He wanted a partner. Right. I can't do this alone. And he said, well, no, nothing ever happened, and I'm not going to say it. Um, they're, they're very angry with him, but I'm thankful that the kids have been able to go on with their lives. And um, that they, um, you know, it's hard, and especially when people keep throwing things up in the news, you know, things in the news deal keep coming up. It makes it hard. Let's wrap this up. You've been great, Dottie. I'm curious what what you what have you learned most in all of this about either life, humanity, yourself, Jerry. What, what have you learned? In Hold on to the things that are important in your life, um, which to me is our family and friends, um, and. You know, sometimes I'll just, I'll be walking or I'll be working, even when I work out or something, and I just think, you know, what is this life all about? And it's to help other people is what, what we're here on this earth for. And some people throw you down and do things to you, but you've got to just keep going and try to do the best you can and be who you are. Thanks, Dottie. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate it.